Good afternoon. My name is Todd. I'm a regional missionary. I'm a Christian. Takes the Great Commission of Christ very seriously. As Jesus was preparing to return to his rightful position in heaven after his life of ministry and sacrifice, uh, both in a literal and figurative sense, as he was getting ready to ascend back into heaven, he told his disciples to go out into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. There have been times I've been out here and every creature included mostly squirrels, rabbits, and the occasional wasp, and very few people. Today there are obviously a few more people out than there have been out over the last several months. Some of that, as I have mentioned earlier in the morning, has a lot to do with how, how much fear there was to be out in public, even outside. That's a kind of a tragic thing to see a town like Lanesboro have to suffer through that kind of economic devastation. I'm glad to see so many people out and enjoying this town today. Another conversation that's been taking place a lot lately is a conversation about justice. So one of the ways that we have come to define justice is we use a modifier to that word, that word being social. Social justice. And every single person that you talk to, no matter who it is that you ask, everybody's got a little bit of a different idea of what social justice is. For some people, social justice is being aligned with the Black Lives Matter movement. For other people, social justice is to stand with groups like Antifa, the anti-fascist group. And still for others, social justice means to stand with groups like Antifa and Black Lives Matter, but even more radically aligned groups. And then there are groups who, who would be on the opposite end of the spectrum who believe justice is only for them. And any time that you have to put a modifier on a word like justice, you're starting to get into, I don't want to say scary, but it can be troublesome territory. Because justice is justice. There's no, there's no social justice. There's no perfect justice. There's no such thing as justice for one group and not justice for others. You, If you do not have unadulterated justice, there is no justice at all. And many people have suffered injustice. Others have suffered unjustly. There have been people who have suffered justice and deserved it. And there are others who have been sacrificed on the modern day altar of contemporary ideas of justice for holding to opinions or positions that society as a whole does not agree with. And there are times where that's good. A radical neo-Nazi, while he might have the freedom of speech, should not be allowed to spread hate. A radical Marxist should not be allowed to stir up division and hatred towards people who are, say, Christian or Muslim. They shouldn't be silenced for that. And that person, while he has the freedom to hold his views and even speak them, is not free to silence others. Today our world is divided on a lot of different lines. If we looked at our world from the perspective of a geographical study or survey, the divisions that 
run just in the United States alone are like numerous massive fault lines like the San Andreas Fault. Heaving, buckling, shaking, coming into contact with one another and putting pressure on the topography of the culture of the United States. And those different fault lines run along economic justice, racial or ethnic justice, gender justice or gender equality. And we've become a nation that talks about everyone being equal and regarding one another as individuals, but we yet, as of yet, have come to a place in the United States where we actually look at people apart from how they appear. Sadly, the one solution to that problem is often the one that is quickest rejected. As a Christian, I don't proudly say that I reject the world's idea of justice. I just say humbly, if I were to embrace the world's idea of justice, I would end up doing injustice to someone. If I align myself with one particular movement over another, I would end up excluding someone. But as a Christian, my particular religious ethos, my particular religious philosophy, when embraced in its totality, excludes the idea of excluding anyone based on their ethnicity, based on their culture, based on their nation of origin, based on their sexual identity, whether you believe it's chosen or you're born that way. All of those things have no place in societal thought, and Christianity is the only religion that, when taken to its logical conclusion and held to its most philosophical, intellectual truth, allows for that kind of equanimity. Islam. Everybody marvels at how Islam is spreading across the world and Islam is the most exclusive religion in the world. If you're a Jew, you cannot become Muslim. Islam executes homosexuals. Islam for years looked at black Africans and considered them less than human. And to this day, there is major division in Islam between black Muslims and Arab Muslims and Asian Muslims. And that is fostered in places like the United States in the name of social justice. And again, Christianity is the only religion when taken to its logical end does away with those dividing lines of hostility and hatred. And here's why. It's because Christianity does not allow hate for a particular group of people based on, as I said, country of origin, ethnicity, gender, preferred gender, preferred sexuality, born gender, born sexuality, any of those issues, none of that has any place in Christian thought or philosophy. The Apostle Peter, writing in Acts, in chapter 10, in verse 34, says this to the crowd in Jerusalem, and you have to understand this, Peter, Peter was a Jew. He was a, a, a Jew to the core. There, there was no vacillation in Peter. Now, he was poor. He was a poor fisherman. Peter had nothing when Christ called him from fishing in the, in the sea to becoming a fisher of men. Peter 
had nothing. He was a no one. He was uneducated. He was culturally diminished by the ruling religious elite. But Peter had grown up in, in Israel, in a Hebrew land, that was inundated with foreign ethnicities. Greeks, Romans, others from the Asia Minor area, places like Cappadocia, we call it Turkey today. Peter had been surrounded by these people and even though everybody segregated into their own little enclaves, he, he was aware of these people. And on the day that Peter was speaking in this passage I'm about to read, massive crowds of people from all over the known world had gathered in Jerusalem to, for different reasons, many of them Jews coming in to keep the Jewish laws and the requirements of what it meant to be a Jew at that time. Many of them were Gentiles as well, traveling to make money. They were, they were capitalists back then too, believe it or not. So, Peter's speaking in, for lack of better terminology, the town square of Jerusalem, and he's speaking to a crowd of people that's predominantly Jewish, who hates the Gentiles. I, nobody, nobody understands this. The, the Jewish people hated Gentiles, especially the Romans. They had no respect, no love, no concern, no care for the Romans, the Samaritans, or anybody else in that area. If you weren't a Jew in Jerusalem, they did not like you. So Peter's speaking to this crowd, predominantly or largely made up of Jewish people, and he says these, these words to them. He, he says, So, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. The word that's translated in the English here, the word that's translated nation, is the Greek word ethnos. It's where we get, etymologically speaking, the root of that word, the word that we have for ethnic, is from the Greek word ethnos or ethnos. It means nations. That's how they identified each other back then. They didn't look at a person and base their acceptance on them on their melanin count or the shade of their skin. They looked at them and they accepted them based on their na nation of origin. And what, what did Peter say? Peter says, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation... Anyone who fears him and does what is right is as acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all of Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, the cross. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not at, to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. As as Caesar is so frequently quoted as saying, and I believe it's made up, I think it's a historical fallacy, friends, Romans, countrymen, friends, people who wouldn't consider themselves friendly towards me right now, countrymen, Lanesburians, Minnesotans, 
If you want justice in the world, if you want ethnic justice, if you want justice for the people that you love, there is one source for that, and that is Jesus Christ. Because His gospel message is for everyone. God doesn't care about your skin color. God doesn't care what country you're from. God doesn't even care about your hair. So if you're a red-headed person out here and you've been picked on, because I have a friend, we pick on him, God doesn't care about your hair. He doesn't care about your physical condition and by way of whether or not you were handicapped by birth, made a handicap through a tragic accident. He doesn't care. He offers you salvation through Jesus Christ. And don't let anybody fool you. There is no white Jesus. Jesus wasn't white. He wasn't black. He wasn't Asian. He was Hebrew. He was from the Middle East. Jesus doesn't look like a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Viking walking around in a robe. Get out of here. Have a good day, guys. True Christianity does not look at a person and say, you're valuable or more valuable or less valuable because of what you look like or where you come from. And it is the only religion, as I've said already several times, that will allow that mindset to be predominant. If you want justice, bow your knee to Christ. Because if you do not bow to Christ, the only justice that you are ever going to receive is going to be at the hands of God. And if you harbor hatred in your heart for another person, whether they're black or white, native, first nations, aboriginal, Asian of any sort, or a, any mix thereof, if you harbor any hatred, if you are a white person who has bought into the idea of white fragility and white guilt and you hate other white people, God hates that. If you are a white supremacist and you hate anybody who isn't white, God hates that. If you are black and you hate white people, God does not justify that. And that is not justice. If you are a person today who concerns themselves with justice and you think that the way you do that is by ridiculing people because of how they look or the job they have. If you have applauded law enforcement officers being killed in the line of duty because gosh darn it, they deserve it, God hates that. If you are a law enforcement officer or you're in any way affiliated with someone who's in law enforcement and you've applauded when someone is murdered unjustly at the hands of a law enforcement officer and you say, don't hold them accountable, they're just doing their job, God hates that. He's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care about your job. I would draw some distinctions and say if you're an active hired hitman, God despises your job. If God looks down on you and he sees that you are a medical doctor performing abortions, he hates that. Why? Because he has made every human being, even the unborn, in his image. White, black, Asian, Hispanic, Aboriginal, First Nations. Every human being is made in the image of God. Amen. And he hates hatred. I've had people tell me, God has no hate in him. You are so wrong. God despises those things that violate his holy character. As this couple went by and said, God is good. Yes, he is good. And because he is good, he has to hate wickedness.
If you think you can escape that, or you can justify your hatred for someone for any reason, you do not understand how utterly wretched and wicked you are if you think it's okay for you to hate another human being. I have a friend, a very dear friend, who has a daughter that at the very young age, I believe she was 15 or 16, was walking home and she was going through a public park and a monster of a man pulled her into a very sheltered place and he assaulted her in the most repugnant and disgusting of ways. And it would have been so easy for this friend of mine to hate the man who did that to his daughter and I would have applauded him for feeling that way. But you know what they did? What he and his wife and his daughter and the rest of their family did? They pled for mercy for that man and they forgave him in the courtroom. And she bore his child. She bore his child. Now my friend's forgiveness of that man and his daughter's forgiveness of her oppressor, her victimizer, is a tiny little shadow of what the forgiveness of God looks like. Because the forgiveness of God is like a blazing hot sun that when you consider it, when you think of what was necessary for you to be forgiven for all of the ways you have oppressed other people, all of the ways that you have done injustice to others, of all the ways that you have hated another person, committed violent sin against other people, and worse, all the ways that you have violently sinned against God, in your rebellion against the one sovereign of all creation, God's forgiveness is a blazing white sun of heat that radiates from the cross where Christ hung. And Christ on the cross absorbed in himself God's holy and just hatred for all sin whether it's the sin of ethnic hatred or the sin of pride against another person that you think you are better than, Christ absorbed that hate for that sin that God poured out on Him. As Jesus hung on the cross, the Scriptures record in his history records that during that Passover time in that year a great eclipse took place as if the sun had been blotted out and it makes perfect sense when you think about it it was the most horrific act of injustice that has ever been done ever Christ suffered at the hands of people who didn't deserve to even be in his presence. And the same Peter who talks about God not looking at people based on their ethnos, their ethnic background, is the, the Peter who told the Jewish people earlier in the book of Acts that it was God's plan to use them with their wicked hands to hang Jesus on the cross. So the very murder of his son was foreordained and God still holds the people who did it accountable and he still forgives them if they will come to him in repentance and faith.
That is the message of the gospel. So if you've grown up in this region of Minnesota, well, any region of Minnesota, really, it's almost impossible to escape the influence of all lives matter, ma'am. If you've grown up in this region of Minnesota, the entire state, of, but upper Midwest, really, it's impossible to escape the influence of Christianity of some form, whether it be Roman Catholicism, Lutheranism, have a good day, John. Lutheranism, Methodism, Baptist, Evangelical Free, Presbyterian. There's not a lot of Presbyterians around. They started down south and they tend to not like being up in the cold weather. But it's impossible to escape contemporary cultural American Christianity. And we hear the word gospel so often. The gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Luke, the gospel according to John. And no one really knows what that means. The word gospel means good news. It comes from a Greek word, euangelion, which literally meant one who bears good news. How are you doing, guys? And those who, in the ancient Israel, in the ancient world, the messengers who would travel far from a, a battle, they would watch for them from the city walls. And they could tell by the shuffle of their feet and the way they were kicking up dust, or if they were kicking up dust, what kind of news they were going to be bearing. So if they were watching from a long ways off and they could see the runner coming and there was a large cloud of dust trailing behind him, they knew that the runner was bearing good news. And the, the saying, beautiful are the feet that bring good news, comes from that. And that is a phrase that's repeated in the New Testament. The beautiful feet of those who bring the gospel. And the gospel is that euangelion, the good news. But in the context of the scriptures, it's not just any good news. It's not good news that we've killed the COVID-19 virus and you don't have anything to worry about anymore. Not that that's going to happen anytime soon, or at least this year. It's not good news that we found a way to perfect racial unity. That would be beautiful, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. The good news of the gospel is, this is going to sound funny, you're a sinner, you can't earn salvation, and Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty that you deserve. And he suffered for you in your place if you repent and believe the gospel. That's the good news. And it's complicated, but it's easy. There's a old theologian, well, not old to some people, but there was a theologian who has subsequently passed in the last 30 years or so, and he said this, that the, the gospel is such a message that it's so simple that even a child can believe it, but the most intelligent of people will spend all of their lives trying to understand it. And there's also a passage in the scriptures that gives us kind of an idea of where he got that. There's a reference to the angels as they surround the throne of God. And they consider God, and they consider man, and then they consider the fallen angels. <clears throat> knowing that the fallen angels have no chance at redemption. A fallen angel can never be redeemed. And they look into the mystery of the gospel and long to understand it. Angels cannot understand the gospel. One, because the angels who have not fallen, the angels who have stayed loyal to God, have no need of salvation. And the angels that have rebelled against God and were cast out of His presence can never be redeemed. J Jesus' death will not save a fallen angel. And then the scriptures say that we were created a little lower than them. And yet, when we sin against God, 
Christ pays that penalty for us. And that blows the angels away. They don't, they don't understand that. Huh? How can you take this sinful creature that is of no value, but has no worth because of how sinful they are, and you will redeem them? That causes the angels to marvel. And that wraps up two things, mercy and grace. We hear that a lot in courtrooms, right? We hear people talk to a judge, and we'll hear family members of a, an accused and convicted murderer pleading with a judge, have mercy on him, have mercy on him, please, for, for the sake of our family, have mercy on this man. And human mercy isn't really mercy. And here's why. In the courtroom, if a man is found guilty, or a woman, a male or a female, is found guilty of such a heinous crime as murder, and the penalty for that crime is considered just when it is the death penalty, then any judge who acts outside of the prescribed measure of the law is not showing mercy, he is doing an act of injustice. But God, the giver, the grantor of the eternal moral law, is not. Because he's already punished someone for the crime that you committed. And so, when you sin, against God, you deserve His wrath. And it's merciful of Him to not take your life the moment you sin. That's an act of mercy. And that's what mercy is. It's not getting what you deserve. If you deserve... And you can see that a little bit in a cop when he pulls you over and you're doing 55 and a 45 and the cop pulls you over and then he doesn't write you a ticket. That's kind of an act of mercy. But he's also, to some degree, violating the law, so he's not being just. And so we hear about grace. Oh, that was so gracious of you. Oh, that was so... Man, you show me so much grace there. We don't really understand grace either. Grace is when you are given something you don't deserve. So, in the case of my friend that I told you about just a little while ago whose daughter was victimized in a horrible way. They didn't have the power to do mercy to the man who victimized her, but they showed graciousness. They, they had grace upon him and asked the judge to be as lenient as the law would allow him to be. And that's the difference. Mercy is when God withholds from you the due penalty of violating His holy law. Grace is when God grants you forgiveness when you do not deserve it. And He does that through work, the work of Christ on the cross. So if you're out here today and you think, I was raised going to church. I did my first catechism. I did all my confirmation classes. Something tells me by the tone you just used that is untrue, sir. But when you do all these religious acts, or, or maybe, you, maybe you say, I'm a good person, I don't believe in any kind of higher power. There is no such thing as a God. If that's the case, okay. But if you're relying on your goodness... You will fall according to your own standard because no one can be good. Because you'll be inconsistent to your own standard of goodness. It's a paradigm shift. I consider this to be good, but then if somebody that I really like does something to violate what I consider to be good, I'm going to cut them a break because 
I don't want to lose my friend. You've just violated your own standard of goodness. You've shown favoritism, which is a form of injustice. So injustice is a natural part of the human condition. And so while we fight and squabble and bicker and complain and protest and rally and riot and burn down neighborhoods and scream at one another from across divided roads, every single person that's doing that is guilty of injustice because they have established for themselves an idea of what justice is and they violate it every day. You will lose your ever loving mind trying to figure out what justice is as we determine it in the American culture today. Like literally today, what's justice? I, I don't know. Let everybody out of prison. Well, that's not right because there's people in prison that are guilty. Lock everybody up. Can't do that because not everybody's a criminal. Well, they are. Like how, don't go into a grocery store without your mask on. That's a criminal penalty. See, we just, we have vacillating standards. We're inconsistent. And the more inconsistent we are, the more confused we get, the more confused we get, the more we cry out for justice and equanimity and equality and equity, and the worse it gets because nobody has an answer. No one. The mockers think they have an answer, but they don't. There's only one source, and there's only one truth. And if we disagree, there's, only, there's really only two or three options. If we disagree on a point, we're either both wrong, one of us is right, and the other one is wrong, or we're both crazy. But we can't both be right. It's impossible. And that's how justice works in culture today. Everybody has their own idea of what it is, and then there's this glaring glaring, loud shout from all of creation coming from God that says, I am justice, and I define right and wrong. I am the definer of good and evil. I am the definer of justice and injustice. And any standard that you hold to outside of my standard is an act of sin and injustice, and you are always going to be wrong if you disagree with me. Not not me, but the Word of God. And so if you're out there right now and you're hearing this and you're one of those people that says that he's one of those crackpots and I'm an atheist and I can dismantle him in five minutes, I would welcome your conversation. I will not scream at you. I will not holler at you. And we can take it in any direction you want to go. You want to take it to social justice? Fine. You want to take it to racial equity? Fine. You want to take it to uh, scientific proofs that there are no gods? Fine. Any question? Any objection? Well, come tell me why. I, I, if you can prove me wrong, I will take my Bible right now and I will burn it, because I do not want to hold a lie in my hands. I'm fully prepared. And contrary to popular belief, Christians are not emotional idiots. There are emotional idiots in Christianity. But I would love to have an intellectual conversation that's civil and polite, refrains from name-calling, and I know how difficult that is in our culture today. But if you have an objection, bring it. Let's talk it out. Come, let us reason together. That was the backbone of intellect in the United States. That was the backbone of intellect in Europe 
in North Africa for centuries. Philosophy. Christianity is a religious system. Christianity is a religion. It is a faith system. It is also a philosophy. And some of the greatest philosophers of the world were Christian, and you probably don't even know that. But they're everywhere, and I would love to engage with somebody who disagrees. But above all of that, no matter what your belief system is, there's only one hope for justice in the world, and that is through the God of Scripture. Because if we're resting in anything that defines justice, apart from how the Bible defines justice, you will never have true justice. And that's the message. Lean on the scriptures. Trust in Christ alone for your salvation. Do what is right. Repent and believe the gospel because it is for every nation. It is for every people. It is for every ethnic group. It is for every economic group. It is for every societal group, every culture. It is for everyone. It is the only religion that promises that. 